too. With that, we are live on YouTube now. So I'd like to call the special meeting of Prescott Town Council for May 19th, 2022 order, please. And I ask for an approval of the agenda under item two, that recommendation being that the agenda for the special council meeting of May 19th, 2020 be approved as presented. Do I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Shankar. I think I saw Councillor Jansman seconding. Any comments, questions on the agenda this evening? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion is approved. Item three, declarations of interest. Any member of council have a declaration of interest to disclose tonight? Seeing none, uh, we'll move right along to item four, presentations. And we do have one presentation under 4.1. I'd like to welcome Richard Sheridan Willis and Ingrid Bjornsson from the St. Lawrence Shakespeare Festival. Uh, did we all, sorry. Everybody's moves around as we're, I thought I lost Richard and Ingrid there for a moment. Uh, so welcome Richard and Ingrid tonight uh, to give us a presentation on current status of the uh, uh, Shakespeare Festival with regards to finances and of course the uh, uh, the very sad need to uh, to cancel this uh, this summer's festival. So Richard, if you want to take take it away, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Todd, uh, councillors. Uh, we welcome this opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, I firmly believe the town of Prescott is our partner. Richard, your, uh, your, your, your audio is just a little low, at least it is for me. Is everyone else just? Let me turn it up. How's that? Is that better? That's much better. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, just to say, I'm happy to talk uh, to you all tonight. Uh, we believe the town of Prescott is our partner. Uh, we've worked hard in keeping the town notified of all our major decisions. Uh, indeed, when we made the decision to cancel or postpone, uh, this summer season, the town through Mayor Todd and Matthew uh, were the first to know. Uh, the first thing we would like to say is that we recognize the importance of the local importance and value of all the organizations that uh, receive the community grants. Of course, the festival works closely with St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. Uh, we have an evening with the food bank. Uh, my, my girls, personally, my girls have benefited from the girls in summer camps over the last uh, five years. And uh, my youngest was looking forward to uh, the Prescott Minor Soccer this summer. Uh, however, I'm here to talk about the uh, Shakespeare Festival this evening. And uh, as the mayor said, an update on the actions that we have taken in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I I'd like to start from last fall when I last spoke to you at council, a time as uh, Councillor McConnell pointed out at that October meeting. It's a time that I uh, wish that I hadn't had to come to you, uh, the council, but I think it's essential just to touch uh, briefly on all the things that had gone into the coming season and that were directly influenced by the help that we received uh, from the town last October. Shortly after the last October meeting, we held a two hour town hall meeting uh, with our supporters and public to uh, receive their input. Then we held several in-house meetings uh, to discuss the way forward with friends like uh, Ken Duran Sr. and past artistic directors, Rona Waddington and Ian Farthing and past general managers, uh, Ingrid uh, Bjornsson and Rebecca Campbell. Uh, we made the decision not only to return to St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church as a rain venue, but also to perform all our Wednesday matinees there. Uh, the guaranteeing of shows would enable us uh, to promote group sales, uh, possibly bus tours, and detailed plans had already been drawn up to actively approach and advertise uh, to that market. Uh, we raised our ticket prices uh, for 2020, a thing we hadn't done for quite a while. And with feedback from core supporters and to make the season more attractive, we changed our season and replaced Henry V with the musical, The Fantastics, uh, our first musical and the longest running musical in the world. Uh, we were bringing back old favorites and experienced festival uh, performers like uh, uh, Carrie Ann Doherty, Ian Farthing, and Warren Bain. Uh, Warren was to lead our week long summer drama community a youth program. Uh, we landed the rights to Mary Poppins. Uh, I think it was a popular choice after the rather risque choice of Cabaret last year. Um, we had a hugely successful fundraising Summer Dreams Gala Dinner. Other fundraising events were being planned, a June uh, garden party, golf charity tournament on August the 29th at Prescott Golf Club and an exclusive dinner at the Colonel's Inn. After James Richardson announced in February uh, that he was leaving the general manager post uh, for the Ontario Jazz Festival, 
uh, we brought in Ingrid um, as our general manager, uh, Ingrid's experience of the festival and her willingness to work uh, part-time would be a cost-saving move as well as a valuable asset to the festival and to, to, to me uh, going forward for the season. Um, I moved into Prescott in December full-time with my family. Uh, this is a move I've been planning since 2018. It was my wish to become more involved uh, and a part of the Prescott community and more hands-on in the day-to-day -day running of the festival. Um, we had secured, uh, actually on the day of the Summer Dreams uh, dinner gala, Lisa McLeod and Steve Clark uh, came along in the afternoon and to announce that we had secured the Ontario Arts Council funding uh, for the next three years. And finally, uh, we had cut costs with a, a rent reduction at our office and as I said, Ingrid's part-time a salary as general manager. Coming to the recent present, um, after four weeks of deliberation and presenting numerous budgeted scenarios and ways that we might be able to stage our 2020 season, we came to the sad but inevitable decision to cancel, postpone our season until 2021. We are in conversations with <coughs> Canadian Actors' Equity over a termination fee uh, for the company of actors and stage management. All company members have been offered the same positions for 2021. And our hope is that they will accept uh, this concession in lieu of a termination fee. However, if this were to go through and we had to pay out uh, the termination fees to the actors and stage management, it would cost the festival over $13,000. Uh, we have received the check, our OAC grant, uh, for, I, I've forgotten the exact number, it's 23,000, around 23,700. Uh, it does not have to be returned. It's there for operating costs. Um, and as I said, Ingrid has taken over as general manager. Uh, the future, the future is uncertain at this point. Uh, there will be no theater uh, in Canada this summer. Uh, all theatres worldwide are looking for subsidies to help them navigate, I'm sure you've read about it, help them navigate through these times. Uh, the question was asked at the last meeting, would we be looking to come to the town for more help in January? Uh, short answer is no. Um, we are looking and have been looking at ways to reduce our costs. Um, one of them is rent reductions uh, at our office and dressing room. Um, uh, through the Ontario uh, Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Programme, of course, it's the, it's the landlords that have to apply for that rather than the tenants. And I, I, as artistic director, will be taking a salary cut of 33% until the end of the fiscal year. Uh, we are working on a fundraising strategy, uh, which will include a campaign uh, in the next, uh, fundraising campaign in the next few weeks, reaching out to donors and uh, potential or regular ticket holders uh, to help us with our operating costs and to enable us uh, to do the restructuring needed, which brings me um, to how we will be operating in the next few months without the season. Uh, we will use this time uh, to uh, restructure and build in all areas of the festival, such as marketing, uh, data tracking, uh, ticketing, bookkeeping, financial software, hardware, and uh, interior work on our office space and storefront. Our props and costumes on the second floor have all been sorted uh, by the wonderful Sharon Flood, um, but they now have to be all inventoried. Uh, with the limited time and resources that we've had in the past, uh, we have not had the opportunity to tackle uh, these tasks. Uh, the stage productions are a small part of our day-to-day -day running. Uh, if there is a silver lining in all this for us, it's that we now have that opportunity to overhaul and work on making the festival more efficient and ready for when it returns in the future. Uh, we do hope to stage Mary Poppins in the fall, uh, but of course there's no guarantee that this could happen. Um, but if the situation allows uh, and there is an opportunity, we would prepare um, and possibly early rehearsals could be held online. Other events we have been exploring are the solo show season in the fall, if restrictions allow, drama workshops this summer in person or online, and an online festival talk series with uh, guest speakers. Um, 
And we have been, of course, exploring all government subsidies and grants to help the company through these difficult times, uh, which brings me to the community grant. We understand that the town, of course, has extra pressures and calls on the finances. At this time, uh, theatre companies all over Canada uh, are, and worldwide are facing uncertain times. Uh, theatres will be the last organisations to be able um, to open up. The company, even without the season, still has operating costs, and there will be a payout of certain fees for work already done by the designers, the directors, and the musical director, and as I've said, possibly for the actors and estate management. Without the, uh, the community grant, it will be challenging for the festival to continue. Even if we mothball the company for six months, we could be in danger of losing the staff, and not only that, but we could lose our OAC grant, which is there for operating costs. And we'd also lose valuable time that we could use to restructure and strengthen the inner workings of the festival. We want the opportunity to fulfill the town's belief and support uh, you gave us last October. We believe we were on the way to achieving that with the steps that we had taken, as I mentioned previously, and we're bitterly disappointed that we were unable to present a season uh, this summer. Uh, with Prescott's downtown businesses taking a hit, and some closing like green things next door to our office. Uh, we would hope our continued presence um, would serve as a boost to the community uh, in difficult times uh, ahead, uh, even if it's just a promise for the future. In preparation for tonight, Ingrid drew up some financial projections. I, I don't know if you have them, but one was our original budget for the season. Uh, and then there are five projected scenarios going forward. Um, the final scenario uh, was a long-term projection and plan to see us through to the end of the fiscal year. We also included uh, a percentages breakdown uh, projection of our government funding and donations. Uh, this is what we'll be aiming for uh, from uh, government and from corporate and individual donors. Uh, federals 14.1%, municipal 20.9%, provincial 27.5%, foundations 10% and individual 31.4%. Uh, um, going to the COVID-19 emergency funding, I'm happy to announce that we have secured a, a Canadian emergency business account loan. That's a loan of up to $40,000 over the two years, which up to 10,000 uh, may be uh, forgivable. Uh, the Canadian emergency wage subsidy, uh, the applications are now open we're in the process of determining our eligibility. Uh, Heritage Canada Emergency Support Fund, uh, that's Lisa McLeod's uh, department, cultural heritage and sport organizations. Uh, we don't qualify for phase one because the funding is done uh, for people who already receive grants uh, from Heritage Ca uh, Canada and from the Canada Council, but uh, we are holding out hope for phase two. And for the Regional Relief and Recovery Fund, uh, the parameters of this fund are still to be determined, um, but the application would go through the Grenville Community Futures Corporation. Uh, if you ask us uh, where the community grant uh, would go towards without the productions this summer, uh, these are the main areas. It would uh, defray financial losses due to COVID-19. It would assist us in meeting payments due to our suppliers, uh, artists and small businesses. It helps the festival maintain um, critical operations to survive this year and prepare for the uh, next year's festival. And it supports planning and purchases that help improve and are surely going to be needed uh, with the public health and safety practices in the future for the festival. Uh, and finally, it will aid collaborative efforts in areas such as event planning, uh, insurance training, to play a vital role in the town's recovery efforts, we hope. Uh, it's hard to predict the future right now. Um, we will hope to return fitter and stronger next year and be ready to play a part in the town's resurgence in the summer of 2021. Uh, in the meantime, as I said, there's a lot we can do to structure and develop the festival. 
uh, while taking opportunities to bring culture and visitors into the community uh, if uh, that is advisable and when conditions allow. We are not attempting just to maintain our infrastructure, we are trying to improve in all areas of our organization. As was noted at the last meeting, I have suggested that we split the payment into two parts uh, to help with the town's cash flow. Uh, these times are extraordinary and we fully realize that it's up to the town to distribute the community grant money as best as they can under these difficult circumstances. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard, for that uh, very thorough uh, overview of the season, the current situation. Uh, Ingrid, welcome back. Good to have you back here in Prescott. Uh, anything to add to that? Uh, have you just kind of logged in for moral support for Richard tonight? Anything, anything <laughs> from the management perspective you'd like to toss in? Basically what, you know, what everything that Richard has said, I was here, if, if there was any specific um, financial questions anybody had, we were pretty excited to have received the, uh, the uh, the line of credit there we we'd heard that some nonprofits hadn't received it so that, that certainly helps us with our with our cash flow um, all of our all of our projections in the budget are and um, I guess that's just what I wanted to uh, to kind of reinforce is that it's certainly our intent to uh, be fiscally responsible and and um, not that we weren't in the past, but, you know, uh, and just, uh, you know, make sure that, that we come back um, uh, stronger than ever in, in uh, 2021, should we be allowed to gather in, in uh, large groups. Thanks very much, Ingrid, and thanks again, Richard. Open it up for uh, comments, questions from members of council tonight. Councilor McConnell? Well, first of all, uh, Richard, may I say you're the only one that I've seen that I'm glad to see his hair growing long again. Uh, I, I know in February at the, uh, at the fundraising, you had very short hair and, and until you opened your mouth, I didn't actually realize who it was. Uh, your accent uh, gave you away there, but I see it starting to shag out again. Anyway, um, what you've said is, is exactly what I was hoping to hear, that you have a concrete uh, way forward. I think the fact that you're taking a whack in your own salary um, speaks volumes right there. Um, and the fact that you are quite willing to let us, uh, if we decide to give you money, do it in halves. And I think that's a wise thing uh, for our finances, um, Shakespeare by itself is, is part of the whole in Prescott. It didn't start out that way, but it has certainly become part of the whole. I mean, when you look at what we have, we have, uh, well, the ends on my screen right now. So I'm gonna say we have soccer, but the vast majority of people in town don't play soccer. We have hockey, the vast majority of people that don't, don't play hockey. We have curling, again, the vast majority of people in town don't curl, and we have Shakespeare, and probably the vast majority of people in town don't go to Shakespeare, but they're all part of a whole, and you start whacking one out and another one out, and all of a sudden you don't have enough left to make it worthwhile. So um, I'm, I'm glad to hear what you've presented to us tonight. It was what I was hoping for. And I think we should uh, continue to support Shakespeare. I think a gap might be very detrimental and I'm not sure that uh, we could get it back if we had a several month absence. Um, the one thing that I'm curious about though, and I, I think I'm right on this and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, but uh, I don't think we've had a member on your board since uh, Fraser failed to get elected in the last election, have we? And under the circumstances, I think at this time, we should again have a member on your board. I don't know who can answer that or who wants to, but feel free. And that's all I have to say, thank you. I don't know we've ever formally named a council representative, have we? Well, Joanne was uh, yeah. on council 
was on the board. Fraser was on council, was on the board. Robert, again, it seems like we've always had one. I don't know whether we've had an official one or not, but I think it'd be nice under the circumstances uh, that we did uh, have a, a closer affiliation at this time. Yeah, I certainly don't disagree with that. I just, I, I, there's never been that formal relationship, so we'd have to uh, create, I, I would think. Uh, uh, Kimberly, am I correct on that? We've never formally named uh, a council rep? That's correct. It's never been put in the annual council appointment by law. Okay, thank you. Very good idea, though, I, I believe as well. So open it up for other uh, comments, questions. Uh, got Councilor Burton and then Councilor Jansman, please. <coughs> Thank you. Um, nice to see a lot of positives here, uh, Richard and Ingrid. Um, the loan of forty thousand and um, the grant of twenty three thousand seven hundred. Where are those funds going to be allocated? The um, uh, yeah, I'll let Ingrid answer that. Sorry, sorry Richard. Yeah. The the twenty three thousand um, has gone towards operating expenses. Uh, rent, salary, um, you know, uh, utilities, that sort of thing. Um, the forty thousand, as it, it's a line of credit, we're hoping to use it mostly for cash flow um, to help us through the dry periods, so um, that we're not incurring interest on our own personal, not our personal line of credit, but the Shakespeare line of credit. Um, at the end of the day, we are certainly hoping to take advantage of the ten percent or the ten thousand dollar forgivable portion of it. Um, but until that happens, until I know that it's paid off, I'm, I'm not spending that money <laughs> just yet. <laughs> um, we do need, um, as Richard had mentioned, our, our accounting software is probably 10 years old. Um, that is one area where we need to um, invest some money. So definitely part of it will be, um, will be to that infrastructure, a new computer, new software. Um, that sort of thing, but generally speaking, it's it's um, rent, utilities, salary. We have had some production expenses, but obviously most of those have now stalled at this point. But over the year, there are there are production expenses that do come up. Thank you. Any follow up, Councilor Burton? Nope, that's that's good. I I was just assuming that they would it was going to um, operational uh, costs, so. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Councilor Jansman. Uh, thank you, Richard and Ingrid for your information. And I agree with Councilor McConnell. It, it's, it says quite a few points in there and kind of screams to me as well. Um, you did mention that you had financials there. Matthew, we didn't get them yet. Is that correct? That's correct. Great, I look forward to, to looking at them. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Further comments, questions? Not seeing any, so I guess the way we'd uh, move forward with this, because we do have the financials that are out there and obviously there's at least one counselor's expressed a, a desire to, uh, to take a look at those. Uh, so we could bring all this forward to the next council meeting. And in, in, in addition to the two other, we should have an update on uh, minor soccer by that point as well. I see uh, Brockville, unfortunately, they just canceled their season on, uh, I think it was Friday. So in front of Young was just a little bit before that. So there's a, a, an unfortunate trend there developing, but uh, hopefully maybe we would see something later in the summer. But soccer, and I believe, what was the other one? Uh, uh, Girls Inc. Was that the other, uh, just the two other requests in addition to Shakespeare, correct? Matthew? Yeah. That's correct. So we could just uh, handle all three of these, get updates uh, for all three, and uh, make the decision on Shakespeare in two weeks' time, if everyone's okay with that. Uh, Richard, Ingrid, uh, you're good for two weeks uh, as a wait. There's no absolute urgency for the money right now? Yeah, definitely. The, the, uh, that line of credit is, is, is golden right now. Okay, so if everyone's good with that, we'll just, uh, staff could bring that back. Uh, uh, actually, a motion for staff direction to bring a report back on the three outstanding community grant items for the next council meeting. Anyone willing to make that motion? Moved by Councillor Burton, seconded by Councillor McConnell. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? So motion is carried. So we'll move that final discussion forward for a couple of weeks. 
And uh, thanks uh, so much to Richard and Ingrid for uh, attending tonight and uh, giving such a detailed presentation. It's uh, a sad summer, and, and obviously in many ways for a lot of projects, uh, and uh, especially for things like any, any live performance event. So thanks for all you're doing. You're definitely uh, sharing the pain of this. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have some better news as we move into the fall. And you know, this is the one good thing about COVID-19 is it does afford some chance for renewal and rejuvenation. And obviously you're, uh, you're looking at all those options right now. So hopefully uh, we'll all get through this and uh, we'll see a much uh, better 2021 for all of us. Uh, including the St. Lawrence Shakespeare Festival. So thanks again for attending tonight and we'll be back uh, with you on that final decision in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Have a great night. Thank you. Have a good night, folks. You too. <clears throat>
Thank you. Uh, I do have a couple questions, if I may, Mayor Todd. Certainly. Um, uh, the BIA minutes of number two, um, they talked about in the minutes of lowering the levy. Is that something that the BIA, BIA will be making happen as soon as possible? And if so, what is the process for that? Uh, the decision actually in the meeting uh, was not to proceed with uh, with lowering the levy at this point, seeing that it was uh, such a small amount of, uh, of money. I believe that was the, the general decision, although I, I can't remember if it was a full motion or not at that meeting. I don't know if uh, Math, Myth, Mr. Armstrong, do you remember that one? I don't uh, see it on the... Yep. So uh, the next meeting, which was uh, at the beginning of May, that uh, was discussed again, and the a decision of the BIA was to continue with the same $29,000 levy um, broken up uh, based on uh, commercial property taxes. So uh, no change in the, the total dollar amount and uh, that was uh, passed by the, the BIA. Apologies, Councillor Burton. I looked at that and didn't see the date. That was the earlier meeting where it first came up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the other one, uh, a couple other ones, um, the cemetery board, everything's on track there, just so everybody's aware of that. And also uh, number five, the email from the Prescott District Soccer Association treasurer, treasurer uh, Leslie Todd. Um, I was going to mention um, about that, but if we're, we're gonna be able to bring that back in two weeks, along with Shakespeare and Girls Incorporated, we can um, touch base on that. They are asking um, just to cover their cost of uh, $2,701.87 because um, they have uh, cured uh, some costs during the registration uh, process. So if we could uh, definitely add that to our list um, in two weeks, that would be uh, fabulous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that's good information to have for that uh, follow-up discussion. It's just why we really need to have it in two weeks as opposed to looking at it again tonight. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyone else have any uh, comments, questions, or want to refer anything uh, from the info pack this week? Seeing no, so we'll return to the motion to uh, accept those, uh, those items. All those in favor? Thank you, motion is approved. And so on to item seven this evening, uh, the staff report 7.1 is staff report 31-2020. Uh, that's the CAO's updates on COVID-19 actions uh, so far. And this is a fairly uh, extensive report this week, Matt. So if you just want to hit the highlights there and uh, take us through uh, some of the key uh, changes, including, of course, we had some more announced even today. Certainly. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, Mayor. So the state of emergency has been extended to June 2nd uh, in Ontario and publicly funded schools uh, at that point were going to be closed till May 31st. However, the follow up today is that they will be closed for the remainder of the school year. Uh, on the May 14th, um, there was a, a number of uh, stage one reopening guidelines that were uh, uh, announced by the uh, uh, province as well as on uh, effective May 16th, golf courses, marinas, private parks, uh, businesses, uh, boarding animals were allowed to open. And then a number of retail as well as other sectors uh, opened, uh, were able to open today. So there's a, a long list in there and it goes on for several pages. Um, and then uh, also today we received a number of other uh, pieces of information such as uh, schools not opening, uh, a further clarification on uh, parks and what amenities can and cannot be used, and then as well as uh, some information on childcare and um, worship uh, ceremonies and uh, for uh, for churches. So uh, we're still incorporating all of uh, those more recent announcements from today, but certainly uh, moving in that direction. Uh, the federal government um, continues to have the border closed, and uh, just today they extended it to June 21st. Um, as well as the uh, stipulations are in place for uh, commercial passenger ferries until at least June 30th. So uh, those remain in place. Anyone returning to Canada from outside of Canada has to self-isolate for a minimum of 14 days. So there's uh, certainly quite a few things that uh, with last week's announcements, uh, 
we want to kind of review all of our uh, facilities and see uh, if there were any changes or anything that was being affected. And so I'm just going to walk you through some of those. So town hall uh, wasn't uh, specifically addressed, uh, remains closed to the public, employee, employees can still work from home. That's still an essential uh, tenant from the government is that uh, physical distancing is still in place, uh, working from home, reducing your number of uh, visits outside the home, uh, those types of things. Uh, we would uh, not see uh, hiring the seasonal admin position, uh, which was part of the budget at this time, uh, simply because we don't have a full complement of staff in here at uh, Town Hall, so it would be very difficult to, to manage from that perspective. Um, implementing changes to the first floor uh, office area uh, for when the public is allowed to enter. And so reducing the number of desks and sculling uh, permanent plexiglass as a barrier along the entire front of that desk, as well as installing a door at the end of the desk. So not, this is not only for um, public health and safety, but it also uh, is to deal with security um, and put that in place for our staff. Uh, that uh, kind of is a return more towards what the second floor uh, looked like. So it's a good opportunity to, uh, to implement both and, uh, and be able to move forward with that. The Leo Boyer Community Center remains closed to the public. Uh, it's continuing to work as the uh, site work site for the half of the operations department. Uh, the operations building is uh, again closed to the public and continues to act as a work site for half the operations department. Um, I would recommend proceeding with the hiring of the operational seasonal staff to support regular maintenance activities. Um, the compost site continues to be open Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday from 10 to 2. A uh, water house would remain closed, uh, no regular scheduled uh, cleaning. Uh, the health center uh, would remain closed to the public with the exception of Elizabeth, uh, St. Elizabeth Healthcare. Uh, they're providing uh, home care uh, type uh, amenities to uh, individuals and uh, they're taking care of their own cleaning. Splash pad remains under construction and specifically uh, pools, splash pads, those types of things are to remain closed. Marinas are allowed to uh, now open and uh, what we're putting forward is uh, marina leaseholders would be able to start docking uh, at this time. Um, the water, power, uh, fuel, as well as uh, pump outs will be available uh, starting today. Um, and then we would uh, forthwith uh, bring on the marina summer student positions. Uh, we would also offer the lighthouse and pool returning students uh, positions at the marina. And so that, that way um, we aren't sure exactly what the lighthouse and pool uh, holds in the future and whether we'll be able to open them. So uh, being able to address as many of our returning students as possible and giving them positions at the marina. Uh, Canadian transient boaters uh, can stop for fuel and pump out services only. And uh, what we're suggesting at this point is uh, no docking for transients. That would include American visitors, the borders closed and therefore uh, we would not be uh, accepting uh, American visitors to our marina at this time. Picnic tables, barbecues, uh, outdoor picnic area would all be not available. Uh, we would uh, implement uh, procedures for gas and pump outs and masks were to be worn uh, on the docks at all times and when physical distancing isn't possible. No cash transactions and uh, moving forward, uh, we would work towards opening the marina building for May 29th, but in a very strict and uh, following the health and safety guidelines that had been put out by the province uh, which uh, certainly speaks to social distancing, um, hygiene, uh, cleaning, those types of things. And so uh, we've come up with a number of uh, standard operating procedures for during COVID-19 specific to the marina and have taken the health and safety guidelines that have been issued by the province uh, for marinas into account to develop uh, those guidelines. Also uh, been in contact with uh, Gananoque as well as Brockville to ensure that we're following uh, the procedures that they're uh, developing and working towards. And so uh, trying to work in concert with, uh, with all three municipalities. Uh, the lighthouse uh, remains closed, uh, again, uh, suggesting offering the students that are returning uh, to work at the marina, uh, not planning on opening the lighthouse anytime before June 30th. What I'm trying to say there is that we're trying to set a date that we don't have to keep readdressing it in the next week or two or three weeks um, to say, well, are we gonna open the lighthouse or are we gonna open the pool? If we can say that we're not gonna consider it before June 30th, then we can start to reallocate staff and uh, move some of those other initiatives forward. 
Uh, speaking of the pool, it would remain closed. Specifically, the provinces uh, said that they will remain closed at this time, reallocating the students to the marina if they so wish. Tennis courts, court access only, no clubhouse access. Uh, we're trying to make sure that the wording that came out this morning matches the wording that uh, came out last Thursday around uh, tennis courts and uh, just being able to move those forward. And parks allowing usage of the open activity areas uh, following dis uh, physical distancing. Additional information came out today on the use of picnic tables, uh, benches, things like that. So certainly want you to incorporate uh, those into it. Uh, but then play structures, uh, any exercise equipment, anything like that is uh, strictly uh, off limits at this time. Uh, the beach uh, to be remaining closed. And I have been in contact with the library and libraries are allowed to establish a drop off uh, pickup uh, type of service. And uh, they believe they can uh, implement that by Thursday of this week and do it in a safe manner that uh, respects uh, social distancing as well as uh, uh, making sure that hygiene and uh, cleaning is uh, taken account for. So that's my report. Hopefully it wasn't uh, exceedingly long, but uh, certainly covered most of the topics there. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Armstrong. Uh, very, uh, very good, very thorough report. Open it up for discussion, comments, questions from members of council. Councillor Young, then Councillor Burton, and Councillor McConnell, please. I meant to go back and read the um, <coughs> directive a second time, but I don't remember barber shops and beauty salons being allowed to open. Are they? No. No. Okay, I'm just curious. My hair is getting a little shaggy. You don't need to stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Councilor Burton, please. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, are, even though we're not um, opening the pool for the public, but I'm hoping that we're going to open the pool to make sure that everything is running correctly. And if there needs to be repairs, we will be doing this and take, taking that opportunity at this time. So I can speak to that. It, uh, certainly we're going to clean the pool, go through uh, the maintenance procedures, things like that. We're not sure if we're going to fill the pool completely or not this year, uh, but certainly run the equipment through its paces to make sure that there's nothing, uh, and also go do the preventative maintenance on the piece of equipment to make sure that nothing falls behind. Thank you. I, I was hoping that um, at least the pool would be running because uh, water sitting in there can get stagnant and um, create uh, more of an issue than, um, than having it uh, run. Um, I do have a couple more if I can, Mayor Todd. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, the splash pad, um, the committee is just over the moon. Um, the vision is coming together. Um, it's uh, definitely um, everything that uh, the committee had, uh, had wanted. Um, are we going to be doing some testing on the splash pad, uh, Mr. Armstrong, to make sure that um, when everything is said and done, um, the apparatuses are working properly in the water flow and et cetera? Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. So at this point, all the apparatuses are now uh, on the, the splash pad and secured to it. So uh, very happy with that. Uh, as soon as we have the building uh, to a point where it's closed in and uh, ready to go, then the contractor will be back to hook the uh, pipe manifold uh, up. And at that point, we'll go through the testing. Uh, the warranty doesn't start until we actually commission the pad itself. And so, uh, so we just wanna make sure that uh, we align that at the best possible time. Uh, but certainly all of that testing as well as staff training will uh, happen uh, once the building is up and, and ready to go. And we're, and we're hoping um, that staff will be trained um, in hopes that it may open late, late summer. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think from my perspective, if, if we can, even if we get a short season, then that's uh, mm -hmm. better than none. And uh, if, we, if it's a great opportunity to get staff acquainted with the equipment uh, in uh, being able to do that and then being able to learn how to both bring it online uh, from a, a startup perspective as well as putting it to bed for the winter. So it, uh, I think that'd be fantastic if we're able to do it. If not, then uh, certainly we'll do that first thing in the spring. Great. I just have one more, if I may. 
Um, um, how many summer students have we um, hired? So we've provided conditional letters of offer, I believe, to uh, nine or 10 students. And so uh, I believe there's four or five that are in operations, and I believe there's another five to six positions in the marina. So that's where we're suggesting uh, being able to reallocate the lighthouse and uh, pool at this time to the marina. If the, the lighthouse and pool open, then we can uh, address that. But certainly we want to be able to provide every opportunity for our returning students to uh, be able to do that. Nice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Burton. Uh, Ray, did you have a quick uh, comment on that before I go to uh, Councillor McConnell? Just, just uh, the apparatus. Uh, it looks very intriguing and uh, very colorful down there. And I'm sure people are, are dying to get down there to, to use it. That's for sure. It does look good and well done for the committee. Yeah, it's a beautiful addition to Centennial Park. Uh, Councillor McConnell, please. I particularly like the duck. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I agree. That it's very colorful, very colorful. It adds a lot to, to the area. And I've had, uh, I walked through there at least once a day. And it's been a, certainly a topic of conversation. And, and people are anxious for it to get open, but they understand that it can't be open now. But anyway, two things, if uh, I may, Mayor Todd, one's in relation to the library and the pick up and drop off. Uh, that may be a little tough with books because I don't know about anybody else, but I tend to go in and browse and look for something and that's awful hard to do. Well, it's impossible to do under the circumstances that we're gonna have. But uh, we also have an extensive movie library and that's a little easier to do because you can look down the list online of what's available and reserve those overnight and then bring them back. So that'll be quite easy. And there's a lot of people that do that, I know, maybe more so in the winter than the summer, but uh, that will be available as well as the books. The other thing I'm concerned with is the, um, um, lost my mind here the uh, marina I kept wanting to say the museum uh, the marina and, and I had a bit of a, a contact with Matthew over this earlier um, my concern with the arena the arena the marina geez is um, the the component of people from outside of Ontario that have a habit of being there uh, during the summer, in particular Gatineau and Montreal. Montreal, as we know, has been the epicenter of the virus uh, in Canada and continues to be. Um, as I recall, you were originally a declarative state of emergency, uh, Mayor Todd in Prescott, and true or not, what I heard was due to the volume of Quebec license plates that you saw at the uh, grocery store in the North End. Uh, given the fact that uh, we have a lot of, especially Montreal people with their boats in the marina, um, if we're not encouraging Americans to come across the border, um, I, I have to wonder why we're encouraging boaters from Montreal to be coming up here every weekend uh, possibly with their friends. Um, normally, we welcome them because they they visit our restaurants, they visit our liquor store, they visit our stores, gas stations, the entire whatever. Uh, but do we really want the Montrealers in town during this crisis? Um, I'm not so sure we do, even with the limits that... Uh, um, Matthew has suggested for the marina and the other point there is if we make the marina available only to Ontario residents uh, then right off the bat we're looking at operating at a huge loss for the season. So I, I personally I think that's a question that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor McConnell. All good, good questions uh, and good comments. I just wanted to 
just to mention the declaration of emergency, it had nothing to do with Quebec license plates, but just the, the overall influx of snowbirds coming back uh, into the region, uh, regardless of, uh, of license plates. Some were definitely from the province of Quebec, many were from Ontario, and we did see a bit of an issue there as we had that flood coming back in, uh, I believe it was right around the end of uh, third week or so of March that that took place. So it was more of an overall border issue. And also there were a number of reasons why I made the declaration, but you know, another one was to, to get the, uh, uh, the information out there and to make sure that uh, local residents were taking this quite seriously. Uh, because I think at the time this all started, uh, there was a little more of a laissez-faire approach to some of it. So I, I think the declaration of emergency uh, helped focus our communications and, and get the word out there. Uh, just with regards to Quebec traffic in and out of the marina though, all very good uh, comments and questions, but I, the one thing, and I just for complete clarity on this, I mean, all traffic is 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 uh, resumed now, uh, and I think it was always open from Quebec into Ontario, non-essential traffic across that provincial border. Am I correct, uh, Matthew, on that one? That's never been. Uh, I know Quebec was restricting some access into into Quebec from Ontario, but I don't think there's ever been any closure of that border from our side. Uh, that's my understanding. Correct. So that alone would make it rather difficult for us to restrict uh, uh, those those boaters. Uh, it would set a precedent as well, and uh, it would be a, a rather difficult one to manage uh, too, considering we do have, as as, as you mentioned, Councillor McConnell, so many uh, of our uh, of our seasonal boaters from the province of Quebec, and of course have been there for many many years. So it's it's a difficult one, and it is something that. Uh, uh, we had a thorough discussion about all this at the emergency control group the other day, and uh, essentially everyone was comfortable with what was uh, what was brought forward at the time, at least as best as we can be comfortable with anything right now. And uh, the standard operating uh, procedures really do uh, seem to uh, make allocations, and uh, the are pretty uh, pretty rigorous restrictions. So going beyond that, just speaking personally, it's not not something I'd really want to entertain right now with the fact that the, the, the provincial border is open and it, it'd be very difficult for us to, to, to put out restrictions based on, on that basis. I don't think we'd have a lot of support for that provincially. And if anyone did want to challenge us under the law as well, I think that could be a difficult uh, question. Not, not to say I want to go down that road anyways, but it, it just opens a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, potential, uh, a Pandora's box of issues. But just just my take on it. If anyone else wants to chime in on that, please. Gory, did you have? Uh, yeah, I. Shaker? I understand where Councillor McConnell is coming from. Uh, I, I respect the 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 worry that he he's pursuing here, but I really think we you know if if the province is mandating that we can open the marinas and um and they believe it's safe then if we're following the provincial direction i don't know how we can restrict which borders can come now uh the americans they're not allowed to come because the borders are closed we're not we're not saying they can't come we're just saying they're not allowed because of the borders that's not our that's the i guess prime minister of trudeau saying that but for us to say that, you know, uh, a, a Quebecer can't come off the highway and come down and go to Tim Hortons, uh, you know, I don't think we can say that. Just, just like you said, for, for many reasons. And we don't want to get into a big uh, legal battle over something like that. So I agree with you. Any further discussion on, uh, on the marina overall, actually? And uh, we can just cover all the, uh, everything off here now, both, uh, based on Councillor McConnell's points or any other concerns or questions on the marina, because that's obviously the most, uh, it's our biggest, uh, it's our biggest point of contact with the outside world uh, for the next little while, uh, especially in regards to, uh, uh, to COVID. And we all know it is, uh, it, it is a hot spot still in Montreal and Quebec's sort of the epicenter of, uh, of, uh, of the pandemic in Canada right now, uh, sadly enough. Uh, but any other comments on, on just the overall marina operating and, uh, what Matthew's presented uh, in regards to that this evening. Councilor McConnell, quick follow up to that, uh, your points? Uh, actually nothing to do with that, um, okay. but a point of information for anybody who, who may not have been there or were aware of what's going on, but my walk through the Marina this morning, 
the uh, the truck was there about to foam um, one of the finger docks, uh, the one they uh, spent the winter under the ice, and that they've been trying to keep float with uh, inflatable bags that they've put in. Uh, we are now using uh, Coast Guard approved foaming technique, same type of foam apparently that's in boats. And they were heating up their machinery about to do it this morning, explained to me how it was done. But it was a surprise to him and actually a surprise to me that when he looked at the docks, uh, I always assumed when I were docking those finger docks that comes off the main dock, I presumed each one of those was separate and they're not. Uh, the opposing ones are one long tube that goes right underneath the main dock. So um, when we have one <clears throat> that's causing a problem, it's not just one finger, it's the whole finger. Um, but he explained to me how it's done and um, that, that he's done it very successfully in other places. So. I think this is a, I, I didn't, I didn't want to be nosy enough to ask him what he's charging, but I figure Matthew will uh, let us in on that, but it seems to be a very uh, uh, worthwhile endeavor to, to try and prolong the life of our dockage. When did you become so shy? What's that? When did you become so shy that you didn't ask the cost? Well, it's all this time I'm spending alone. I'm not socializing anymore. <laughs> it, it's not only approved by the Coast Guard, it is environmentally acceptable, which is yeah. the problem that we had with the last phone we used. Uh, it was not environmentally friendly. So that, that's a big, big plus. And this foam doesn't soak up water like the other one did either. Uh, it's put in uh, in a liquid, in layers actually, and rises like uh, yeast, I guess, and bread, and then another layer is, is put in. And, uh, he can do up to 200 feet with his line, so he could, uh, if he had to, go right out to the far end of our main dock and, and do uh, the, the tubes out there. Thanks very much uh, for that update, Councillor McConnell. Good to know. Uh, Councillor Jansman, you had a comment? Matthew, in your report, um, when you make reference to the students, um, we, are, we are hiring the students um, to work in the marina, uh, taken from the lighthouse and the pool, as you mentioned, but that's only for returning students, correct? We didn't hire new students. That's correct. And so we often qualify to get funding for student um, employment. Was that being offered this year, being such a special year? Uh, we absolutely submitted uh, on time. Uh, like uh, everyone else, we're, st we're still waiting to hear. So I did uh, put in a call last week, as well as I had a conversation with a couple of other municipalities, and no one has currently heard about their uh, Canada student jobs uh, for this year. Um, but certainly uh, we did submit and we have high hopes of being uh, it being a little bit more lucrative than it has been in previous years and uh, given uh, what the economic circumstances are. Which one follow up, if I may, Mayor Todd? Todd? Um, so the, the students that are returning from the pool and the lighthouse, will there be enough work at the marina to spread around? Uh, we believe uh, so. and. Usually we would have uh, five to six students at the uh, marina with uh, the cleaning regiment that we need to put in. Uh, we quite possibly might need a next one or two. And so uh, we believe that uh, absolutely there would be enough work uh, for the uh, ones that are returning. And it's not guaranteed that they'll all want to come back because uh, certainly right. it's not a job they applied for, but, uh, but certainly still, uh, we still feel it's economical. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Jansman. Any further comments on uh, the CAO's report this evening? Uh, just a couple really quick comments myself, just mostly, mostly mainly in regard to, uh, to the pool and the splash pad. Uh, just so people in the public uh, don't get too excited about that, it's great to see the, uh, uh, the splash pad coming along. It's looking gorgeous down there with the installation of all the uh, uh, the apparatuses and uh, of course uh, you know the pool has to be 
checked out and, and, and looked at for this summer, but it's going to be very difficult to staff uh, facilities like that. That's probably going to be one of the bigger uh, uh, questions that we need to look at as we move forward, just in regards to social distancing, uh, use of the washrooms down there. It opens up a lot of potential problems with regards to community spread. I did see that, uh, I think it was Mayor, one of the larger cities, I think it was Mayor Tory in Toronto, made a comment today or yesterday that he was really hoping that uh, public pools uh, would get the authorization to uh, to open sooner rather than later. And that, so it, it, you do have to wonder if we're going to be faced with this, uh, this question in the next little while. And that to me is going to be a difficult one because there are a lot of uh, potential problems there if our numbers are still as trending as high as they have been. I think they just, there's a slight uptick again to over 400 uh, in the province. So it is, a, you know, the virus is still with us as we, we move towards opening, but something like a, uh, like, like a municipal pool and even a municipal beach in cramped uh, quarters uh, could raise some real questions regards to the safety of our staff, the safety of the public and so forth, uh, because community spread in those situations would be quite difficult to avoid, but it is an evolving situation and we'll just have to see what, uh, what comes forward there in the next little while. That'll go back to, uh, uh, the emergency control group uh, for, for review before it goes on to council. Uh, so uh, we'll be able to take a good, uh, good, good, strong look at it. I know other municipalities are already asking the question. I talked to a couple regional uh, councillors and mayors this afternoon, and that was one of the items uh, that came up as concern about uh, municipal pools and, and beaches and facilities like that for the summer. So uh, all great points and uh, we'll certainly uh, do what we can there as we bring everything forward. And, but I, I just did want to, to make that note, despite the fact we are moving forward and finishing the construction of that splash pad, it is very much uh, up in the air uh, for determining an actual opening date. We'll open when we can obviously, and, uh, but we're gonna have to do it safely. <clears throat> Unfortunately, right now we uh, got a lot of questions about that still. So thanks uh, so much for everyone, uh, everyone's discussion on uh, that this evening. Uh, the control group meets again. Uh, we moved it up this week, right, Matthew? We're meeting tomorrow morning. Uh, so uh, so we'll, we'll have an update on that uh, for council. Matthew will send out his usual uh, email update, uh, reviewing everything that was discussed there uh, tomorrow as we try to keep pace with the province uh, with the uh, almost daily announcements now uh, moving towards reopening. So thanks again, everyone. And with that, we'll move on. Access my agenda here. So moving along to uh, 7.2, that's another staff report for information. 32-2020, uh, uh, Quirks projects ongoing during the pandemic and looking for some council feedback. Uh, Kimberly, did you want to take us through that report? Yeah, sure, Mr. Mayor. I'll be brief tonight because we have quite a bit more to get through. Uh, so looking at my report, Lindsay and I have been busy uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. We're working a mix from home and also at town hall up to three days a week. So we've been working on the uh, typical statutory requirements of the clerk's office, burial permits, death registration, agenda <laughs> minutes, meeting facilitation and records management, and also assisting with IT, um, creating a bylaw index. Lindsay's been doing a great job uh, doing that, getting that in the file hold and also um, helping out with enhanced communication efforts along with Katie Forrester. So prior to the pandemic, Lindsay and I had put together a list of some policy development and uh, bylaw updates that we wanted to work on over the next six months. We'd like to proceed with doing that now. And I'd just like to get your feedback on a few of these before I bring them back to council over the next few months. You don't need to give me feedback tonight. I just wanted to get it out there, put it on the table, and then if you wanted to email us, give us a phone call, whatever you wish. The first one is the procedural bylaw. It hasn't been updated since late 2014. It predates myself at the town of Prescott. And we just wanted to make some simple enhancements to it, um, which includes like an enhanced section on the closed meeting section, uh, basing procedural matters on Robert's rules of order, linking the procedural bylaw to the council code of conduct, and uh, formally consolidating all the various amendments since 2015 into one new bylaw. Then turning the page, looking at various policy development that we wanted to implement. Um, it's clear that we need a formal complaints policy at the town of Prescott. The Ontario Obinsman uh, definitely says that each municipality should have a formal um, complaints policy written out 
that the public can look up and find at any time. We have kind of an informal one on our website right now through our form and the report a problem feature. So we just wanted to put something formal in place. We also want to look at a flag policy. Most municipalities have a flag policy that's closely tied to provincial and federal um, protocols surrounding flags. So we wanted to bring that before you. And then in coordination with Dana and the Economic Development Office, we wanted to work on a simple recognition policy for certificates for businesses, various personal anniversaries, gift baskets. We wanted to tie a budget to that and have a formal policy in place. So if you'd like to provide some basic feedback tonight or offline to Lindsay and I, that would be uh, much appreciated. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Ms. Castleman. Uh, great uh, report, a lot of good information there. Open it up for comments, uh, questions on those items, and if anyone has anything uh, else they'd like to suggest in terms of uh, working on updates for right now. Councilor Burton. Thank you, um, excellent report. Um, Ms. Castleman, um, I do like the idea of uh, the recognition policy, just, um, I think it's important. Um, also, I think it's important to recognize our employees, anniversaries and, um, you know, good work habits, whatever, um, but uh, definitely looking forward to um, getting our policies up to date and, um, and getting them online up to date. So thank you. Thank you very much, Councilor Burton. Uh, anyone else? Uh, so seeing no other uh, formal comments, uh, Kimberly, I guess uh, you, you provided this as a roundabout uh, uh, introduction to what you're doing, but if anyone has, as, as, as the clerk did mention, if anyone has any further suggestions uh, going forward, please email them in and uh, the staff will uh, take a good look at that and as they move forward. And the one positive again about this, it does give a little time, as I mentioned during the Shakespeare presentation, for a little rejuvenation and uh, focusing on some things that might not have gotten full attention uh, while things were operating completely under uh, normal circumstances. So good to see all this uh, moving forward. The one, uh, and it, oh, sorry, Ms. Kalsman, do you have a comment? No, go ahead. I just, well, sorry, I just wanted to say through you, Mr. Mayor, um, the first project I wanna tackle is, is updating the procedural bylaw. So I will send out a consolidated version of our current procedural bylaw to you all tomorrow. You can start taking a look. And the next step, I, I guess, would be to provide me with some feedback as to what you'd like to see change or if you're fine with it as is. And then I would bring that forward in a month or so, um, the original bylaw with some red track changes so you can see um, some potential changes that we could make to it, improvements. And it has been updated, I'm not gonna say completely uh, or, or, or all that extensively, but we have modified how we've been doing things internally here quite a number of times, including just uh, at the start of this term when we, we, we changed the, uh, the committee format and uh, the, the committee chair format. So there's some, there are some good changes there. The one thing I did want to ask though, uh, you just reminded me when you brought that up again, has the province indicated uh, whether the changes that they brought forward to the Municipal Act, will they be permanent with regards to uh, virtual meetings in particular? I'm assuming they will be, but has there been anything from uh, that ministry to indicate those changes are permanent? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the changes um, that were implemented that are permanent is that we can have these types of electronic meetings um, at any time when there's a declared state of emergency at the municipal level or at the provincial level. So that's permanent going forward. I haven't heard if this is something we can do ongoing if we haven't declared an emergency. So it'll be interesting to see um, where the province stands over the next couple months on that. Yeah, I'd imagine uh, there'll be some real pressure to go to this uh, on a permanent basis because especially with larger townships and you see some of the ones up north with uh, people spread out over significant distances and trying to make it to meetings in the wintertime can sometimes mm -hmm. be problematic. So I, I, can, I can see there's some tweaking there uh, possibly coming forward. Uh, so oh, and the other one I did want to mention just on the flag policy because we do actually have pride coming up uh, again quite, quite shortly. And we, we did have, I think on the... Uh, uh, on our on our capital at one point or was it operational projects of installing the new uh the additional flagpole uh so we could avoid the the issue that we had last summer of flying uh, the multiple flags simultaneously with the canadian flag and the issues that uh, that can cause so mr armstrong do we have any update on on how that flagpole is being installed and uh i know this is kind of a side uh, side tack here but we are coming up this is our last meeting in may and we do have pride month coming up in june 
So the uh, flagpole has been purchased. It's just a matter of trying to install it and do that while uh, maintaining social distancing. So as soon as it uh, provides an opportunity where we can do that, then it will be installed. Um, but until that time, then uh, we're just kind of in a wait and see. So uh, in terms of the flag policy, then, I mean, this probably won't be in time for this. We'll just have to discuss, to discuss how we're going to recognize Pride this year overall. We should probably add that to the next uh, to our next meeting. It, it is at the start of June, but I mean, it's uh, not like we have to have everything completely uh, decided uh, before the, the month begins. Anything further on the policies uh, suggested by uh, Court Councilman tonight? Seeing no, thank you again uh, very much, uh, Kimberly, for that uh, thorough report. And again, anyone has any extra feedback or recommendations, uh, please uh, email the clerk. Thank you. And uh, seven point, uh, sorry, seven point uh, three is staff report thirty three dash two thousand twenty on the twenty twenty operational budget. This comes with a recommendation uh, that council approve one the twenty twenty operational budget with total revenues and expenditures of nine two zero four seven thirty. That's nine million two zero four seven thirty. And two, the 2020 water and wastewater budget with total revenues and expenditures of 2,887,570. And three, that the final property tax payment for 2020 shall be split into two equal payments due August 31st and October 31st, 2020. And four, that the 2020 estimates bylaw for 5,526,500 2020 tax ratios bylaw and 2020 capping thresholds bylaw be prepared for the next meeting of council. Do I have a mover for that uh, motion? Moved by Councilor Young, seconded by Councilor Ostrander uh, to get that on the table for discussion. Mr. Armstrong, take it away. Okay, so uh, we've talked about this a number of times and so I just wanted to uh, see if we can uh, come to a conclusion on it. And so uh, you see before you this evening uh, the um, process that we've gone through to get to this point. Uh, originally on March 16th, uh, we'd recommended a property tax levy increase of 1.55%, as well as a water and wastewater increase of 2% uh, be enacted. Obviously, uh, the circumstances have changed, the economic environment has changed, and so we had additional uh, conversations throughout March and April, as well as the beginning of May. So um, what you see before you this evening is a 0% increase budget. Um, by removing the 1% dedicated to infrastructure reserve, removing the 24,000 in additional sidewalk repairs, uh, so that it would be uh, remain at the 51,000 where it has been for the last couple of years, as well as reducing the town hall repairs budget to six uh, by six thousand dollars. So uh, that's uh, currently the operational budget. In terms of the water and wastewater budget, uh, we've had a number of discussions around uh, that, and on April 22nd, uh, council approved uh, moving forward with. Um, keeping the rates uh, unchanged until December 31st. Uh, we haven't had a discussion as to when and by how much they would increase at that time. So that will certainly be a conversation uh, that we can have uh, over the coming months. Uh, but certainly uh, that's what you're seeing in front of you this evening. So a couple of uh, things, again, 0% property tax levy increase. Um, the uh, net contributions to reserve of approximately uh, $1.5 million um, before capital and operations. And then uh, water and wastewater is also uh, increasing the reserves. So I uh, certainly wanted to highlight those. And at the same time, um, we said that by the end of May, we would discuss exactly when the property taxes would be due for the final uh, payment uh, for this year. And so my recommendation is to move the July 31st one to August 31st, uh, which would prepare us for making the education payment in September uh, for education taxes and then moving the August 31st one to October 31st, uh, which would uh, prepare us for making the final 50% of education taxes uh, in December. So uh, that's uh, what you're seeing uh, before you this evening, as well as at the same time, uh, the three bylaws that would come back to enact uh, the various tax ratios and uh, tax uh, rates, as well as the capping threshold for 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Armstrong. So no dramatic changes here from what we were looking at before and the, and the, the alterations that we made in the, in the recent weeks with regards to uh, the 1%, the 1.55 total, and of course, uh, water and sewer. Uh, so any uh, discussion, I'll open it up for uh, council for comments, questions on uh, this report. Councilor Young, please. Matthew, do we have a, 
Um, guesstimate as to surplus or deficit from last year? Uh, we're still working through some of the final uh, uh, numbers, but we see it being uh, just a, a very small surplus. Okay. Uh, my only disappointment in, in what we're presenting here tonight is that 1% um, that we started on the infrastructure um, <clears throat> amount that we were going to put into reserves every month, every year. Um, but I have been assured by the treasurer that if we do have a surplus through the year 2020, that will be the first amount that we set aside that equivalent of the one percent into the uh, into the reserve column right yes absolutely so <laughs> I, i've had a discussion with a number of counselors uh, uh, on this and i would absolutely recommend that if we're able to offset all of the losses in revenue and uh, whatnot through savings uh, in uh, expenses then if we end up with an amount uh, in excess of uh, uh, expenses at the end of 2020, that we would put uh, up to the amount of the 1% into that infrastructure reserve as the first part with the remaining amount going into fiscal policy. Um, so that way it, it allows us to uh, have that flexibility. Our work is to, um, to try and uh, preserve that infrastructure uh, 1% as best possible. Uh, while at the same time uh, understanding that we don't exactly know what the effects on revenue expenses will be over the next couple of months uh, and uh, throughout the rest of the year. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Young. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Armstrong. Uh, Councillor Jansman, I think, had her hand up? Yes, I did. Thank you. Um, I thank you, Matthew, for this report. I, I'm in agreement with um, all four points, including the two suggested dates for the two um, for the final property tax amounts of it, of of the change to August 31st and October 31st. I was very pleased to read that um, all the partnering uh, municipalities have uh, agreed with the Rideau St. Lawrence uh, late payment request. So that's wonderful. Um, Along the same lines of what Councillor Young and, and Matthew, what you were saying, um, I too, and I, I spoke with Matthew and, and, you know, just keeping the focus of our, our of a long game, you know, and um, that um, if, if there is a surplus, that it, it would go to a maximum of 1% uh, to the infrastructure reserve versus the fiscal policy. So, Am I correct then, Matthew, in um, thinking that we need a motion uh, to make sure it goes to infrastructure versus fiscal policy reserve? Uh, you are correct. If, uh, if that would be a friendly amendment to the, the current motion, then that'd be fantastic. Or if you wish to uh, wait till later in the year, that uh, is possible too. But just a motion uh, saying that uh, the first part of any surplus up to the amount that would be equal to the 1% uh, infrastructure contribution for 2020 uh, be put into the infrastructure reserve and the remaining uh, to be uh, allocated to the fiscal policy would be fantastic. Uh, we could, but we'd be operating blind on that because as you just mentioned, we really don't know where we, we're going to be with revenue through the course of the year. True. And so that's why it only comes into play if there's a surplus. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know there's a lot of variables. We don't know where our revenues are going to be. We don't know what our AR is going to be. Yeah, yada, yada, yada. But um, just to have it in place so it doesn't go off the radar, because I think it if a motion be. isn't made, then it just automatically has to go to the fiscal policy. Yeah. As far as the account, the auditors are concerned, we don't need that until the end of December. So. OK, that's fine. The other part of this, though, that would be good. I mean, I mean, it's all in front of us for to decide, anyways. But the one thing that we, mm -hmm. I think, a lot of us will be holding out some hope for, whether it's uh, in regards to the feds freeing up the uh, the infrastructure money that's already been committed, uh, which of course we've applied uh, for the green fund with the water tower and the recreation fund 
uh, with the arena, the hope is there'll be some stimulus money flowing early next year. And I know a lot of people uh, will say, well, the feds have already gone so deep into, into debt with this now, that's not possible. But I heard the same arguments back under Com when Comref came in and in 08, 09. And of course, the, we, we saw one of the largest uh, stimulus packages ever rolled out. And uh, a lot of municipalities took huge advantage of that. So we, we may even be able to look at uh, maybe there's a way to even add a little more to that infrastructure fund in the fall as we see what's going to be available and what we uh, could possibly apply for even beyond the projects we've looked at. Because as we know, we do have some significant street work that needs to be done in regards to East Street and Dibble Street East or just 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 two. We all we all know of, of other projects as well. So we've got some possibilities there and fingers crossed that it all works out. And maybe we're able to take advantage of uh, of added funding there uh, for infrastructure for uh, 2021. Any further discussion on uh, that uh, that motion and that report? Councilor McConnell? Um, the only thing that I hate to see whacked there, and in all honesty, I don't mind seeing the 1% for the infrastructure whacked at all, because I've never been in favor of that. And everybody knows that. Uh, we put away hundreds of thousands of dollars and have every year for various things. And many of them are for infrastructure and many of them get spent in the year that we put them away or the next year, adding another 1% on everybody's taxes and calling it infrastructure when we're already doing that. I don't agree with, I haven't agreed with. However, Ray said something that could very well bring me on board and what he said was that if there is a surplus, that it go into that infrastructure fund. So I would be fully in favor of the infrastructure fund and I'd be fully in favor of the, at the 1% going forward uh, if we simply didn't add it on top of everybody's taxes. If it was a leftover, fine, put it in, but I'm not in favor of adding on but that's not what I am a little upset about now. What, what I hate to see knocked off of there, and Brad, I think you proposed it originally, was an extra several thousand dollars for sidewalks uh, this year. Uh, I forget what the exact figure was, but uh, we're gonna lose that and go back to the $50,000. And I hate to see that because our, our sidewalks were let go for a few years uh, we've been playing catch up with them. So I'm wondering, um, the sidewalk money that we've spent and we've spent in the last three, four years, I guess, has been split between shaving and pouring new concrete sidewalks. I'm, I'm wondering if this year we could forget the shaving and just put all the money towards pouring the sidewalks. The shaving has been a very valuable thing and, and I think it's a good thing that we started it. But in all honesty, I, I think that the coordination between the shaving and the pouring has been very poor because I've seen sidewalks shaved one year and then taken out and poured the very next year, new sidewalks. To me, that's a tremendous waste of money. But anyway, I, if, if we can't have the extra for the sidewalks, I'd like to see us forget the shaving this year and just do all new concrete for the whole $50,000. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Councilor McConnell. And uh, I think some of that would be liability. And if I, there, there are areas that are identified as, as significant issues, I think we have an obligation to shave them down once they're identified. I, I'm pretty sure that's what Matt's gonna say here in a moment. So that, that unfortunately can lead to shaving one year and then reconstruction the next. But I, I fully agree on the, on the sidewalks, as you know, and it's something we've all agreed on, I think in the past. Can we actually bring that forward? I think we can still pass this tonight but maybe staff could bring forward a, a, a plan on sidewalks, just a little more detail as Councillor McConnell uh, was indicating, and maybe there's a way we can squeeze a few more bucks out of somewhere else uh, to put into sidewalks this year, because we have been, I mean, let's face it, we've been, we've been playing catch up on sidewalks for decades here now, and we've, we've really got to continue this, some of the expedited work. We missed a year, a couple of years ago uh, as well for uh, some internal reasons that, uh, or whatever we just we just didn't get them done that one year so could we do that matthew bring something forward just a little more detail for a discussion in in, in uh two or four weeks certainly so right now the sidewalks are going through their um sidewalk survey and uh, taking the measurements identifying where the trip hazards are uh, identifying which ones 
a possibility for shaving as well as which ones need to be replaced. So I'm uh, more than happy to bring that back. Um, it will depend on timing of when that, uh, that uh, analysis is done. And, uh, and then we can take a look at well, what the next five years uh, holds and then what would happen if you were to double up and, uh, and perhaps uh, make additional investments in sidewalk uh, shaving and replacing and uh, be able to move those forward. Yeah, I think Councillor McConnell's point was though to see if we could even rescue a little more for reconstruction done this year. And I know we're, we're probably gonna be pushing it a little bit, but let's face it, everything's running very late this year. So if anything comes up that we could possibly look at for this year later on, I think if we could keep an eye towards that with the report you bring forward. Certainly, it, uh, and we just need to be cognizant of if we're adding additional dollars to the sidewalk budget, then the chances of it um, unless it comes from reserve of us achieving that infrastructure reserve uh, payment at the end of the year is uh, becomes more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. Councilor McConnell, you okay with that? We'll move it forward for more thorough discussion. Yeah, certainly. Everyone else good with that? So we can proceed with the, uh, with the motion as, uh, as, as moved. Any further discussion on that uh, motion and that recommendation with the four key points? Seeing none, I'll call the question all in favor. Motion's carried. Thanks, everyone. And to continue the general budget theme, 7.4 is staff report 34-2020. Uh, that's the 2020 planning capital and operational projects uh, budget. Recommendation being that council approve the 2020 planning capital and operational projects as outlined in staff report 34-2020. Could I have a motion, please, to get that on the table for discussion? Moved by Councillor Young, seconded by Councillor Burton. Mr. Armstrong, can you please uh, take us into your report? Certainly. So thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, what you see before you this evening is a, a continuous iteration of a process that we started back last September and have been working diligently towards uh, today. So uh, at our last most recent meeting on uh, May 4th, we reviewed all the 2019 as well as 2020 budgets and their impact on uh, cash flow. And this is what uh, is before you this evening. It's just isolated to the 2020 projects because of 2019 were previously approved, but certainly I took notes of uh, the timing of each of those uh, as you want to move forward. So what you see before you is uh, broken into three distinct sections is planning and exploratory projects which are projects that uh, we have are continuing to work on, uh, such as the recreation complex, water tower, uh, the Edward Street uh, bridge work, uh, we'll be working on uh, designing for next year as we bring it forward, uh, reconstruction of Dibble and or East Street, uh, and a number of other projects. Um, most of those, uh, you know, certainly have some lead on them in the course of 2020. Then comes the uh, capital projects. So these are projects that are over $10,000 per item and uh, certainly uh, at the same time are tangible in nature. So it's not a study, it's not a report, but uh, certainly is uh, uh, something that we need to work towards. So the breakwall at the water treatment plant is uh, the largest project on the list and uh, continuing to work on the engineering for that as well as looking at a solution for this fall or for 2021. As you go through the rest of the list, the other uh, larger items are completing the LED uh, street lighting project, uh, which will be funded through uh, debt this year, as well as the sidewalk cloud and attachments uh, and being able to move those forward also uh, funded through debt. So a total of uh, 809,000 uh, for capital projects. And then your smaller projects that uh, don't have, uh, either aren't tangible or don't cost um, uh, more than $10,000. Uh, per item than are in the operational side. And there's a total of 139,000 there. So uh, we've uh, discussed these over the, the last several months and then you'll see the financial implications for 2020 projects. It would be uh, just under $300,000 for the ones that we'd move forward with. Uh, ones that would either happen in 2020 or 2021 uh, were just uh, about 325 and then ones that were funded through debt are 325,000 for a total of just shy of 950,000 in total. So um, that's what you have before you this evening and uh, more than happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Armstrong. Uh, 
no real changes from what we looked at before, I guess. Uh, but any uh, any other comments, questions uh, from members of council on uh, Matt's report this evening? Councilor Young, just just to uh, clarify uh, for everyone else that uh, all of these projects can be completed uh, at a zero percent increase in our 2020 budget. Correct? That is correct. Thank you. Very good point, uh, Councillor Young. Uh, anyone else with comments, questions uh, for the treasurer, the treasurer slash CAO this evening uh, on that report? Seeing we're all good then. Uh, there's just one. Oh, on the, on the CIP program support, I know we've got a planning advisory committee meeting uh, scheduled for the end of the month. Have we actually received any uh, applications uh, for that program uh, this year? Have, have any, has anyone come forward? I think one there's only one uh, that's uh, been, uh, been on the uh, books for a little while, um, but there hasn't been any new ones that I'm aware of uh, that's been received in the last couple of months. Okay, so that could actually result in a, have extra money for 2021 there if it's not utilized or however council wants to move it forward. Correct, so the, the intention of that would be to put it into uh, the CIP reserve fund, let it sit there. If it doesn't, uh, if it doesn't get spent, it'll stay in the CIP uh, reserve fund for the future. Sure, but that would come back, like that's a council decision at the end though, if we did want to do that. Yeah, so we would see it as coming back as part of the 2021 uh, budget discussion as to, uh, what amount, uh, if any, uh, to top that fund up by. Uh, just two other really quick comments. Regional transportation system that was noted uh, up top of the planning and exploratory projects, that's actually in some ways, uh, it, it will tie, it'll connect us to a certain extent, but uh, the, the Eastern Ontario Leadership Council is a body of the Warden's Caucus and the Mayor's Caucus. That's actually much more of a, a like a serious regional uh, uh, transportation study involving pretty much all of Eastern Ontario and interconnections there. So uh, I'm not so sure we'll, we'll have a lot of uh, absolutely direct uh, uh, benefits there, but it'll, it will be interesting to see it come forward. And one of the things that's being looked at now, just a report I got back from uh, uh, the woman who's handling that, that project just recently through uh, my work with the Mayor's Caucus is uh, they're really looking at some of the regional connections into the larger cities in regards to the townships. So we could very much take advantage of that later on, but this is kind of a side, uh, uh, a side project uh, to what we were looking at with the city of Brockville and some of our other regional partners. Uh, I know uh, Mr. Armstrong was talking to uh, city manager Jeanette Lovies in Brockville for some time, but I I'm, haven't talked to Matt about that lately, but I'm, I'm gonna guess that those uh, discussions have really gone by the wayside. Uh, since COVID-19 hit and it's obviously hamstrung the ability for all of us to look at any expanded uh, uh, services. So that's pretty much at a standstill. Mr. Armstrong, am I correct on that? You are correct. And uh, the other one, I just, just a quick question in the LED street lighting. Uh, just remind me, please, Matthew, this is everything, right? This, this catches us up on all the existing areas. So that's Water Street, uh, Fort Town, Mackenzie, and a couple other scattered ones in town. Is that... Uh, Yes, the intention is by the end of 2020 that we will have all of our streetlights uh, switched over to LED. Great. What about the marina? Uh, which part of the marina? Sorry. Uh, if, if I may, along the break wall? Uh, I believe okay. that's included there as well, but uh, I can't confirm. And Centennial Park too? Uh, yes, uh, it would include those. And in front of uh, Prescott Place as well. Uh, yeah, on the water side? Yes. Or, uh, yeah, we can uh, take a look at that. Okay, so we'll, we'll have a report back on that at some point later in the year once we get through the engineering and the work on that, correct? That's correct. Okay, uh, Councilor Burton, you had your hand up? Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Armstrong, can you, um, Give us a short update on um, the noise barriers that MTO is putting in along the uh, 401. I think it's important to um, get that out there for the residents. This time I was waiting for new business, but I don't see that there's anything on the Jennifer new business. And um, another thing too, if I may, um, there is uh, lights out and half out of the overpass on Edward Street. For quite some time. Are we um, addressing that with the MTO? 
Thank you. Sure. So I can, I'll address the noise barrier first. So uh, work was to begin in March. I believe it uh, started towards the end of March and it's supposed to be done by the end of June. However, uh, with restrictions, I expect it to, to take another month or uh, six weeks. So uh, I drove past the other day. They're moving along quite well in terms of uh, putting the uh, stanchions up that uh, the panels will slide into. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my understanding, everything's been ordered. They're uh, working away and it will be completed uh, this summer. So very nice that that uh, will be finally in place yeah. and, uh, and uh, we should make a, a nice uh, look as you, you come into town and uh, also be much better for the residents to, uh, to block out that sound. So uh, mm -hmm. both uh, good news from those perspective. The lights on the bridge, uh, I did uh, have further conversations uh, with uh, both internally and, uh, and with our uh, contractors. They are our lights and we've identified where the issue is. I, we have put in the work order to have it repaired and it's uh, just a matter of uh, scheduling the work to have it done. So my, my anticipation is it should be done in the next four to six weeks and then those will be uh, completely lit up, lit up again. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, Mayor Todd. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Burton. Uh, anything further before I move to uh, calling the question? Uh, so all in favor of that motion. Motion is carried. Thanks, everyone. So that takes us through the, uh, the vast majority of the public portion of tonight's uh, meeting. Uh, Councillor Young? Um, and just another item of new business with regard to um, line painting. I think there was uh, a note about it. It's coming up pretty soon. Um, I have a suggestion that uh, might improve traffic flow a bit. Any intersection that we have with a dedicated left turn lane. So there are not that many of them in town. I'm wondering if we could stagger the inside lane stop stop line back further to ease turns. I know we have done it on, on uh, coming out of the Canadian Tire Yig complex, but I think if we did it on Edward Street at King and uh, maybe a couple other spots in town, um, Churchill and Edward, um, it would help those big trucks get around those corners. Do we need bylaw amendments on that? We, or could we just give direction for that to be moved back? I believe you can just give direction to have it moved back. So uh, the actual position of the stop bar, I don't believe is identified in the bylaw, but certainly uh, the fact that there's a left-hand turn lane in the stop bar there uh, is. So yeah, more than happy to, to look at that um, and uh, coordinate that with our um, uh, the group that, that does that. And so, uh, yeah, there, I think there's a couple of lanes, not necessarily just left-hand turn, but uh, in particular, the one heading uh, west when you come to uh, King and Edward uh, on King Street itself, we would want to move that back. So uh, certainly we'll, uh, we'll reach out to tomorrow and uh, get that, see if we can do it this year. If we can't do it this year, then implementing it for next year. Okay, thank could we, you. Could we bring that back to the next meeting for an update then? Because obviously this isn't on the agenda tonight. So we're gonna need to, to, to look at this uh, before going ahead with anything. Okay, so the question being is, um, so line painting may, we're not exactly sure when it might happen, but it might happen before the, our next meeting. So is this something that you want implemented for this year or do you want it to come back in a report first? This is a tough one because we like we don't know exactly what intersections and the public always these things always seem to work out slightly different. Even with, I, I fully agree with everything Ray is saying. I just the fact that we don't have anything in front of us to approve or not approve just a little uh, makes it a little touchy to just give blanket a blanket okay to it. Even something that could be as, or should be as innocuous as this. Councillor Ostrander, do you have a comment? Just. Uh... Under the Highway Traffic Act, the variances in those uh, stop lines and turning lines uh, is covered in there. They have uh, diagrams and dimensions to that you could go by uh, if if it applied to the size of our streets. That's the only thing. Yeah, I, I'm fine with letting it letting it go go ahead. Really, I just I'm, I'm never comfortable doing something when it's when it's not even on the agenda tonight either. And, it's a little difficult just to put staff direction out when you don't really know what we're fully discussing. But if everyone's okay with that, 
we, we can go ahead with uh, what what intersections are we actually talking about here if we're going to go down this road like what what are the ones where uh, two that come to mind uh, specifically is King and Edward and uh, Churchill and Edward um, I think are the the two biggest ones that uh, that we've seen uh, we've had conversations around King and Edward uh, previously as to how we could make uh, those turns uh, more feasible and uh, and then uh, Churchill and Edward uh, would be uh, another one. But we can uh, work with our contractor and uh, ask them to perhaps uh, just hold off on painting those stop bars until we bring it back to council on June 2nd. And uh, and then that way they can move forward with the, the rest of their work and uh, just hold that in advance. The, the other thing with the line painting as well as we talked about possibly eliminating a parking spot or two or painting uh, in a more dramatic fashion in front of say the Royal Bank downtown Turkish restaurant just to try to keep people out of those uh, those locations. Obviously, that doesn't work uh, 12 months of the year, but and it may not it may not work at all. But it is a significant issue down there with people parking right in the corner, blocking uh, visibility. Now that we've got the new stop uh, the stop uh, lights down there, so I don't know if that's something we might need a, another round of painting for or not just depending on but it's something that probably should be included in the report because we discussed that pretty extensively last year when these changes were made okay okay so you bring that forward then uh sure june 2nd okay all right uh so moving on to councilor mcconnell you had another uh as long as we're talking about streets, I've been forgetting to ask this for the last three times, but uh, we undertook a study from some firm that was actually examining the streets. Uh, they were looking at the substructure, the surface structure, to tell us which ones were the worst and how much it was gonna cost, well, not how much it was gonna cost, but what was involved in repairs, whether we could shave and pave or whether it was a complete rebuild where are we with that study? Has it ever been completed? Has it ever been started? Is it in the midst or what? Mr. Armstrong, then we need to move on because uh, we are we are well off the agenda now. So Matt, could you uh, answer that? Uh... Certainly. So we were going to bring back, uh, hopefully to the June 2nd meeting, a, uh, the results of that survey to show exactly what uh, all the streets uh, came back to in terms of a rating in town, as well as uh, what are the ones that we need to focus on and uh, what the uh, budget for 2020 would look like in terms of where we would be investing in uh, repaving and whatnot. So uh, it was completed. Uh, staff will be meeting next Tuesday, I believe, to uh, just go through those results, identify uh, those uh, areas where we feel uh, the, the best bang for the buck uh, can be uh, derived for the uh, for our uh, paving budget for 2020 and that way we can get it on to our contractor uh, for scheduling in uh, 2020 as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that good enough update for tonight, uh, Council McConnell? Yeah, I asked and answered. It's finished. Good. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll move along then. Uh, we uh, have voted on 7.4, so we're on to 8, the closed session. We do have the one item under uh, 8.1 on purchase and sale. Uh, the recommendation being that council move into closed session to address matters pertaining to 8.1 purchase and sale under section 2392C of the Municipal Act 2001, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board and that the CAO treasurer, clerk, deputy clerk and Josh Eamon, president of EVB engineering remain in the electronic meeting. Could I have a mover please? Moved by Councilor McConnell, uh, seconded by Councilor Shankar. Uh, we will take a, a quick break right after this, uh, but we'll, we'll uh, proceed with the, the vote now. All those in favor? Motion carried. We'll move into in camera, but we'll start with a, uh, we'll just take a five minute break. So 7.52, we'll come back. 